so yeah hi uh good good afternoon um welcome to this epc um policy dialogue which is going to be looking at georgia's future on the way to eu candidate country status um or not forever polarized this is my first moderation of a, a hybrid event um, so excuse me if I make some sort of mistakes during this, you know, on te on technical issues. Um, so welcome to everybody who's present in the room with us um, today um, and to all of you who are joining um, us online. I mean, the purpose of the discussion today um, is, first of all, I mean, again, to, un to understand why Georgia didn't get candidate country status, because I think it came as a, as a surprise to, to some people. Um, or maybe met many people, given the fact that Georgia, you know, was long, long the leader of the pack, if I can put it that way, um, and the fact that it didn't receive the candidate country status. I mean, it got the perspective, but not the status, um, unlike uh, Ukraine and Moldova. I think that came as something of a surprise. Um, and also, we're going to be looking at the priorities that were laid down um, by the Commission, the, the areas where Georgia needs to make significant progress, I mean, the, the, the goals that need to be met. Um, and last but not least, um, what they've done so far um, over the last few months, is it a lot? Is it not very much? And if that's the case, you know, why not? Um, do, the, do the problems that existed a few months ago in terms of, you know, political polarization um, continue to bl block this process to, to a large degree? and many other issues as well. So welcome again. We have a really excellent group of speakers to, um, to elaborate on these points and to share their views, who I'm going to um, introduce very briefly. Um, first of all, um, Michael Roop, who is with us in the room here today. He's the Principal Administrator at DG NIA, uh, responsible for Eastern Partnership um, in the European Commission. Um, Natalie uh, Sabanadze, who is joining us from the United States, so it's morning there. Good morning, uh, Natalie. Um, she's a Cyrus Vance Visiting Professor of International Relations at the Mount Holy Rock College, um, but she's also um, a former diplomat um, and the former head of the Georgian mission uh, to the EU, and she was, you know, deeply engaged um, for many years in Georgia's uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration, including the steps uh, towards Georgia, you know, getting um, a membership uh, perspective. And last but certainly not least, also in the room with us today, we have uh, Tiona uh, Lavreshlashvili, who is a doctorate researcher at the Public Governance Institute at Leuven University and also um, policy advisor at the European Seniors Union. So welcome uh, to you, Tiona. You're a well-known face in Brussels and a, a, a well-known expert and, uh, let's say, lobbyist as well for, you know, Georgian membership um, of the EU. So welcome to you all. Um, so I'm going to start by asking um, our speakers, you know, a few a few questions each, and then we can go to um, the, the discussion. Um, I want to start with, with you, um, Michael, um, if I may. So maybe you can, you know, very briefly, you know, explain again, I mean, what went what went wrong um, for Georgia? Because, I mean, for me, Georgia sort of gone, you know, full circle because it went from, as I mentioned, from being leader um, of the pack in terms of reform, um, fulfilling the association agreement um, to what I would consider to be more than either Moldova um, or Ukraine um, to being to, to democratic backtracking. And then, of course, this led to it. Um, failing to secure the candidate country um, status. Now, can you give us a sort of pointer as to when this, why this was, and when did it start? I mean, when did Georgia start to move backwards? Um, at what point um, in time, and what change, you know, in particular? I mean, was it the 2021 political crisis um, that was sort of the, you know, the harbinger of change, or was it was it something that started earlier than that? Thank you very much. Um, I hope uh, everybody can hear me here and online. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Um, well, let me just uh, start first by saying that we are um, in the situation that we are with all the three new um, enlargement countries. Um, we have made our analysis and our recommendation, our opinion came out um, 
this summer and uh, we're extremely happy as commission that the European Council has um, in um, a very um, unified way supported our recommendations on all the three countries, on Ukraine, on Moldova and on Georgia. I believe uh, even six, seven months earlier, nobody would have believed that the European Council would have given such a clear European perspective to all three countries, such a determined, clear way of saying you're part of the European family and um, when the time is right for you and for us, you will join the European Union. I believe uh, in January even of this year, nobody would have believed that this was possible. Um, the Georgian government itself um, uh, didn't believe it was possible in such a short time frame. Um, they had the rough idea of, uh, in 2024, applying for membership of the European Union. So this was all um, a new development in a new geostrategic reality that we are all facing and that we are looking at on a daily basis. And I believe um, Georgia has, um, has a good way, I keep uh, saying sometimes that, um, accession to the European Union is uh, is a long, long game. Some say it's a marathon. Um, I usually say we are in the first five minutes of a football game um, and uh, nothing has been lost or won. Um, Georgia can still today do everything so that at the end of the 90 minutes, it has scored enough goals to win this game. And uh, this is important uh, for those who are now disappointed, who were very disappointed with our proposals um, of, uh, uh, to the Council in, in, in June, and who were even more disappointed that the European Council actually followed it uh, to the letter. Um, but we believe that um, in the great scheme of things, weighing all the aspects of where Georgia was at the time, and we can, dis we can discuss later if it still is there, um, <clears throat> that we made the right decision and the European Council followed it. In that, we said Georgia has developed well in many, many areas, but there are areas where more needs to be done. And uh, we developed these 12 priorities in order for Georgia as a country, and I'm, I keep saying that this is a responsibility of everybody in Georgia, not only the government, but all the political elites, all society, um, to develop in this way. Now, to your question, when it went wrong, as you uh, as you said, so I believe um, in the two years previous to um, the opinion, um, there have been many incidences where we have been very clear as European Union, and we made statements to this effect locally in Tbilisi, um, uh, and also sometimes when it was more problematic uh, from the headquarters here in Brussels, um, where we said very clearly, this is a development which, which we don't think is good. Um, and there were numerous instances. I don't have to uh, to uh, repeat all of them. All of those who have followed uh, Georgian politics know where the problems were lying. And we have been very clear. We made public statements. So there was no, um, there was no secret about it. Um, we made public statements, sometimes as the European Union on our own, sometimes together with the member states, sometimes with the United States, sometimes with UN, OECD, uh, OSCE, other, uh, other actors. So there was no secret that certain things were not going well. And we do believe that uh, in, in the sum, um, these were mostly the areas which we were highlighting in the priorities and which we analyzed in depth in the opinion. Um, I said before the opinion came out to, to some uh, colleagues who were interested that nobody who has followed Georgian politics in detail over the past two years will be very surprised. Um, maybe clearly when you look at the, at the clarity of, uh, of, of judgment, yes. Um, but the problems were known, let's say. So um, the surprise, some people were genuinely surprised because they believed that ah this is all not this is all not very important issues and in other other areas georgia is indeed well advanced but in but uh, others have not been surprised because they saw this coming let's say um and i think uh, i think this is very important we've given 12 recommendations 12 priorities to georgia and it is up to georgia now to fulfill 
these, to address these, as we say, and to move forward so that when the time is ripe, and we will now uh, on an annual basis um, write reports um, on Georgia, like on all the other enlargement countries. Georgia has now joined um, all the other enlargement countries of the Western Balkans who get an annual report where we say this went well, this went not, uh, this did not go so well. The, there are issues to be uh, addressed. And every year there will be decisions uh, taken on some of the countries when we see a certain level of development has been reached and we can move forward. And in other uh, instances, we say this is all nice, but it hasn't been enough yet. So please do a little more in this and this and this area. And this, I think, is, is very important. Georgia is now a country that will be measured against the same yardsticks as everybody else. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, um, Kosovo, everybody else. So we're here where we are. Um, Georgia can move forward. It is a question of political will, of the government, of the opposition. And of course, one of the biggest problems, and it's number one in the priorities, is the polarization which is very virulent in Georgia. Uh, we can talk about this later in the discussion, but this is one problem that we see that needs to be addressed in, in some shape or form. I think I've already spoken too long. When I start speaking, I could go on for hours, but that's not useful for anybody. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Michael. I think you elaborated you know, very beautifully um, why you view that Georgia didn't receive the candidate country status um, immediately. And I want to come back um, shortly regarding the priorities and what has been done so far, including this issue of political pol polarization. Um, but I want to turn now um, to, to Natalie, because I mean, you were here in Brussels. I mean, you uh, were responsible, responsible for um, if my memory serves me correct, I mean, the finalization and then the implementation of the association agreement and, and, and whatnot. I mean, were you surprised by the decision? I mean, many Georgians that I spoke to, including from civil society, but also from diplomatic circles, said that prior to the decision, when they'd done these tours around Europe and visiting member states, member state governments, many of them were sort of told, don't worry, you know, it's going to be all three countries together. Um, Georgia is not going to be left out. It's all or none, um, and that did, that wasn't the case. And I, you know, I accept the reasons. I mean, the points that you made, um, Michael. I mean, there was backtracking in, in a number of areas. But I mean, we can't also say, um, with due respect, both to Ukraine and Moldova, that they were also, you know, perfect case studies. Huh? Um, there was many issues of concern in in both of those countries. So, I mean, do you think it was fair? Um, but also my other question linked to this is, do you think there was a geographical dimension um, or geopolitical dimension in this? Because obviously Georgia is not um, a direct EU neighbor. It's, a, it's on the other side um, of the Black Sea. It's a bit further away. So could this also have been an element, um, an undisclosed element, obviously, that would could have led to Georgia not receiving the candidate country status immediately? Thank you, uh, Amanda. Very, um, very nice to see you, although virtually. And um, thanks for the invitation. Um, let me share a few uh, points and, and observations. Um, I uh, agree completely with uh, Michael, who said that you know six months ago it would have been absolutely impossible to imagine that we would even be talking about uh, membership perspective. And I remember that very well. While being in Brussels, you know, we were fighting for an extra comma in a declaration, not for the perspective. So clearly, the change has been precipitated by geopolitical considerations. This is not something that this kind of change that happens abruptly is clearly kind of driven by geopolitical considerations. And we know very clearly what these are. So uh, to tie to your question, and I will start from, from the last part, uh, since you mentioned geopolitical geographic um, motives perhaps behind it, I think uh, from the geopolitical point of view, uh, it certainly made sense to keep the three together. Uh, and again, from the perspective of the European Union, but also from Georgia, but let's speak from the perspective of the uh, European Union. I think the trio as a unit is useful geopolitically for European Union. It would have been, uh, yeah, I think it would have been uh, more uh, forward-looking 
uh, had this uh, unity been uh, kept, and it could have been justified. I mean, as you say, uh, Amanda, you know, all three more or less are comparable, uh, except for Ukraine, which is obviously is the, in the war and in the, the front line, and it is a different case. But if there is a differentiation, then you differentiate Ukraine, but not within three. So I have to say, uh, from the geopolitical point of view, it would have been better. Now, whether uh, this was unfair um, or wrong, that's a different kind of judgment. And I think while I say that all three are comparable, there is a kind of implicit hierarchy in the criteria, right? And when it comes to democracy and political criteria, it kind of tops all the others. And this is exactly where Georgia has been lagging behind. In some ways, it is the very problem that Georgia was a front runner. There was so much anticipation and hope, and it kind of backtracked that uh, generated even bigger disappointment uh, than with other uh, cases, I, I would argue. Um, and particularly when it comes to political criteria and when it comes to the content of democracy. Uh, in terms of geography, and, and I'm pretty sure, I have to add, that three years ago, had this discussion been taken place three years ago, Georgia would have received candidate status without any discussion. So there is a clear difference where Georgia was three years ago or where it is now. And that decision reflected that um, regress. And in some ways, then you then it is understandable, uh, while I think perhaps geopolitically not very correct or not very um, uh, wise, I think it is understandable. And, uh, and I also understand the motive, which was like to encourage Georgia to do better precisely in this direction and not to go backwards. So now we have this plan, which is the, uh, the 12 point plan and uh, uh, the country needs to fulfill it. We'll see how it does. I guess you will come back to this. This was not your question. Um, but um, I, I would like to underline that it is extremely important now from the Georgian point of view to be part of the trio, partly because of geography. I don't think geography is a decisive um, factor. I think geography is a relative category. And OK, I'm, I'm not talking literally, but geography is relative. You know, what was used to be uh, east became center and what used to be uh, center became east and so on. You know, this is with time. Uh, our perception of uh, where the center of Europe is, where is West, what are the frontiers are changing. And that has been going on through centuries. So, uh, and we knew it of course before, right? When we were apply or thinking about the European Union that Georgia belongs historically, culturally, also geographically in our view. Um, so I don't think it is an insurmountable difference, uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, however, uh, you cannot change the fact that we are further away and we do not have uh, a land border. So being linked to the three countries, to Moldova and Ukraine, and part of it has always been politically very important for us. And I remember when I was in Brussels, I was trying very hard to keep this three, to keep Georgia in the basket of associated countries rather than in its geographic basket, which is South Caucasus because it was politically expedient. It was necessary precisely for our European perspective. Uh, so uh, what we need to do now is to catch up very quickly and not uh, further um, uh, deepen the differences between, between the three. And I think that would be now uh, decisive. And then I'll come back to your other questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Natalie. I also agree with you that having the free kept within the associated trio um, is, is really crucial that Georgia is part of that uh, for the exactly the reasons um, that you mentioned. Um, and I'm going to come back again on these on these priorities shortly. Um, but I want to come to you now, Etiona, because obviously you've been working on Georgia's Euro, Euro uh, integration as well. Um, for many years. So just before we move to the what's what's been being done, I want to ask you um, about what happened in the last couple of years. I mean, do you think that, you know, what happened with the famous so-called Michel Agreement, um, the fact that it was, you know, quit um, by the sides after this political crisis was it was 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 something that, you know, left such a, a bad taste in the mouth of the EU that it seriously contributed to this decision? 
um, and also the inability of, you know, the main opposition party, uh, the UNM and the, you know, the, the governing um, Georgian dream to, to be able to function together, um, not just within this process, but I mean, more, more generally. And then, of course, there was the issue of the EU financial assistance being rejected. Um, so how much do you think this sort of played into this result as well? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really happy to be here with these distinguished speakers, and uh, of course, I'm happy, and also the participants, and I'm happy also to share uh, a few observations from my perspective. But first of all, also, let me agree with uh, uh, the both speakers, Nathalie and uh, Michelle, if I may, uh, 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 that indeed uh, this granting the EU enlargement perspective to Georgia was a significant breakthrough for our country. And I think that, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, this decision was not uh, communicated in a strategic way also to the citizens because I think that the whole society maybe or citizens and also the electorate uh, uh, was really much prepared for the candidates that that, that was the highest bar right but also I, I believe that the uh, uh, the uh, indeed the uh, European perspective uh, is a first step is the first step that should uh, lead us uh, to this uh, accession path. Um, and also, I would like to share a, a few words about the uh, cu current context. Uh, but of course, we'll come uh, to uh, uh, to a question regarding the uh, po domestic political situation. But I believe that the current context, what we are seeing uh, in the EU enlargement uh, uh, debates, is really uh, beneficial for Georgia. And I see a certain opportunities in this respect. Of course, uh, it was mentioned already. The EU you associate the trio, and uh, I also need to refer uh, to the, um, uh, let's say, last week experience. I, I went to Prague, attended a very interesting uh, think tank forum uh, organized by the Europium, and uh, uh, what the major panels dedicated to the EU enlargement was uh, also the sub panels was always a EU associated trio. So it means that indeed in the perceptions also of uh, uh, Brussels stakeholders, but also uh, in general, uh, also in the uh, national at uh, the domestic levels. So this this is so, uh, a trio initiative still uh, is relevant. And we remember that in the beginning, there was certain skepticism towards this initiative. But I think that uh, in this respect, uh, much needs to be done, particularly also uh, from a cross-country perspective. In, uh, and I, I think that um, uh, um, uh, communication and coordination of these three countries uh, uh, from institutional perspective, I mean, the parliaments, also the governmental level, at the civil society level will be very important. And another development is, of of course, uh, <clears throat> the uh, opening of this accession talks with North Macedonia and Albania, uh, which also signals that there is uh, a credible, let's say, dynamism in the EU enlargement process. Uh, but of course, I think that we need to be cautious uh, when it comes to the candidate status of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, because um, uh, looking at the report uh, by the uh, European Commission, Rather critical report, I would say it is. It uh, raises some questions regarding the, I believe, objectivity of the decision because uh, uh, that might also pose some questions from Georgian side uh, because. Actually, uh, the country, which is still in rather uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, problems with the state building, is receiving the candidate status. And in the case of Georgia, this was not uh, the uh, the decision. Of course, we have two logics. Uh, you remember how Macron has uh, somehow put forward the candidate status to Bosnia Herzegovina. That this was a decision to help the country to um, address the problems. But then, in the case of Georgia, we have the first, uh, let's say, uh, uh, reform that. We have to deliver on the reforms, and then uh, there is the uh, carrot, that is the um, uh, candidate status. But back to your question, dear Amanda, regarding the uh, <clears throat> Charles Michel agreement. Of course, I mean, this is a rather uh, uh, unprecedented, let's say, occasion when uh, so high level engagement, we saw this high level engagement in Georgia. Um, but uh, I think that uh, uh, maybe this was too fast in my, uh, 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 in my view, because uh, I think that the political actors uh, were not really prepared for this high level, let's say, uh, and very fast uh, uh, result oriented uh, discussion. And of course, we saw what we saw. We saw the uh, Georgian dream uh, withdrew from the uh, uh, agreement, but also we should not forget that there were also the main opposition party, the UNM, was not uh, a part of this uh, agreement. And I think that we, in this respect, we always need to uh, speak about the inclusivity of the process. Uh, of course, we know that the ruling parties 
in, in all the societies they have the bigger uh, responsibilities over the processes, but of course the opposition parties should play a fair, fair game in this respect. So did it play the role? Well, I, I say, of course it did, it did play a role. However, uh, I think that, uh, and again, speaking with some uh, actors who were involved directly in this um, preparation of the decision uh, regarding Georgia's candidate status, I'm I'm not happy to share with you the, the, the uh, observation that uh, unfortunately it seems that uh, nevertheless uh, Georgia's uh, geographic uh, 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 location and situation affected uh, uh, the decision. So of course it does not mean that democratic backslide is not taking place. We know the reports, we can have a look uh, uh, at, uh, at these reports, but uh, and this is a process, right? So this uh, this democracy is never a perfect process. So it is uh, uh, there are waves, there are of course difficulties, but then we also need the forward-looking agenda. So I think that uh, with the Commission and also with the Council, we need rather frank discussions when it comes to Georgia's uh, uh, future. Uh, on the one hand, of course, we hope and we we see that uh, Georgia is a part of the uh, uh, European family. That Georgia has the EU membership perspective. But but uh, on the other hand, we also need to uh, have a more, um, let's say, a clear and credible path in this uh, in this uh, respect. I will leave it here, but I'm happy to follow up uh, to the questions. All right. Thank you very much, um, Tiona. Now, I want to start to look a bit on these priorities that were were put there. I mean, I don't expect you to go through um, all of them one by one, Michael, because then we'd be sitting here um, all night. But I mean, can you give us a sort of, you know, um, bird's eye view of what has actually been done um, so far? Because I mean, it seems to me, and perhaps I'm not the only one, um, that the, you know, this like never ending fighting and arguing and that goes on between um, Georgian political parties. I mean, the, obviously the, the the governing party, the Georgian dream, but I mean, the, the main um, opposition party, the UNM, I mean, it's it's... To put it mildly, it's very unhelpful, um, and it, it it makes you wonder what the hell they're actually doing. Eh? Because at the end of the day, both of these parties claim um, that they have the same goal, you know, EU membership. But yet, by having this ongoing political polarization, um, they're not helping to achieve that goal. Eh? In fact, it's actually the opposite. So I'm interested to hear what's actually been done so far, and it's the main obstacle to doing more this ongoing, you know, conflict between the parties. Because I mean, they can't even. I mean, the the, the opposition um, hasn't even been able to come together with the the ruling party in the parliamentary process that was put together at the beginning of this. I mean, you know, we, we know that very well. Uh, they do their own stuff. Um, so what is the, what is the result so far, if I can put it that way? Yes, thank you. Um, very difficult question and, and even more complex answer. Um, well, we've we've um, written down these 12 priorities for the country to start addressing them. Um, we have not given a time frame. We have not said you have to do this within six months. We haven't said you have to do this until the end of next year. We said, please take care of these, start addressing them and start addressing them in a holistic manner. Some of the priorities are very easy to achieve. You have to nominate the five uh, non-judge members of the High Council. It's not difficult to do. It could be done relatively quickly. Some are more complex. You have to find a good consensus um, for the public defender's post. Some are very difficult, like judiciary reform is a complex uh, undertaking and will probably take several months, if not years, ideally, if you need to bring in um, uh, opposition parties around a common goal, it takes a long time. Um, our idea of this was that we jolt the political elite of Georgia into action from all sides. Of course, the number one, as you mentioned rightly, and that's why it is number one in the priorities, is the polarization. And the polarization, let's face it, some um, level of um, discourse that can also be rather aggressive is uh, valid and exists in every democracy because this is how you distinguish yourselves from other parties. But there are levels of acrimonious discourse and uh, fighting that um, become unhealthy 
in a democracy because they um, they seem to show that there is a complete disregard for the position of the other side, not only for the position of the other side, but of the other side. There are um, there are ways to have um, a frank and sometimes also sharp discussion uh, in every democracy, but when it starts becoming personal insults, name calling, um, at some point it becomes a level that is is not useful for a civilized discourse. Um, and I have heard um, expressions about the Georgian political scene that I cannot re re repeat here from many people, but it basically showed that there is not the level of discourse that we want to see um, of a country that wants to join the European Union. Um, and there were incidents of, um, of um, that we said, okay, we have to do certain things differently, even as the European Union delegation when we invited uh, different parties at some different times to discussions with our ambassador in the delegation. Uh, unfortunately, they met uh, in the street and started physically fighting afterwards <laughs> and screaming at each other. That was not the way we want to conduct politics and policies uh, in and around the European Union. Um, so all of these things um, to say that the polarization has to be reduced and we want from both sides some endeavors to, to, to come back to some civilized discourse. What is most important in all the other areas is that we have a process. And we have told this at numerous levels um, from the embassy here until uh, latest in, in the Association Council to, of course, our counterparts, that we are ready to help. The European Union is always ready to help. We have instruments in place. We can finance experts to come to Georgia to discuss laws and regulations that need to be changed, to develop a strategy. And we want this to be done in a way that is transparent and open and clear. So what we want Georgia to change is not something in a secret backroom deal, but we have experts from all levels. We have the OSCE, we have ODIA, we have the Venice Commission. We can mobilize member states experts in certain areas in order to, to come to the table. And maybe it takes two, three, four months to come with a, with a clear recommendation saying, you have to change this, this, and this, and this, and this law, in this law, in this law. And this is what should be done. And then to sit around the table and say, this should now be implemented. We know many things are complicated and we want this to happen in a, in a good way. We don't need knee-jerk reactions. We don't need ticking the box exercises. Ticking the box exercises will not help anybody. And at the end, when we look at it, we say, this is all very nice, but it hasn't really addressed the main problem. And sometimes we think you know that it hasn't addressed the main problem. Sometimes maybe you think it addresses the main problem. What we want is an encompassing, holistic approach. And this is what we have offered. Um, we have now um, seen for the first time that the Georgian government has asked for the amendments to the electoral code to be um, uh, test to be checked by the Venice Commission and by ODIA. And we're financing this um, expert analysis. So this is a good step forward in our in our uh, view. We have October. Many of these could have been started in June. We have October, but nothing is too late as I'm keep as I keep saying, and there is no deadline. What we want is a process where at some point it might be next year, it might be in five years time. It depends on the Georgian government. We can write a report and make recommendations to the European Council that says, in this area, this has been fulfilled. This area has been fulfilled. This area, there are credible steps forward. This area hasn't been fulfilled yet, but there's a process. We will go through all these 12 priorities and make an analysis and make a recommendation. And we do this as long as it takes until we can recommend a candidate status for the country. And we should not forget several things. We in the European Commission are in favor of this. And the ge geostrategic decision that uh, Georgia can become part of the European family has been given with the European perspective. But there are member states, let's face it, there are some member states who don't want any enlargement anymore ever. It is them who we need to convince. It's not 
Georgia, it's not uh, the commission. We need to have a credible approach so that even skeptical member states who are very wary of any enlargement at all, and I don't have to name them, you all know them, are that convinced that there has been enough progress on a technical analysis that politically they can go back to also their population and say, look, guys, Georgia has delivered. There's no question. And this is where we need to go. And this is why it's not an easy exercise. And it needs to be an, uh, an endeavor from all levels in the country, in Brussels, and further afield. Thank you. Maybe just a very quick follow on. I mean, when you're assessing the progress that Georgia is making, I mean, is there very specific benchmarks? I mean, or how do you, I mean, how do you actually measure that? I mean, because different people can measure it in a different way, right? So. Well, as I said, the best is if we all have a process where we sit down together with the experts and politicians of, of, of Georgia, maybe from all the parties, and discuss all together what needs to be done in each part in order to fulfill uh, the priority. We have our analysis of what we believe is sort of the minimum that needs to be done. Um, and, and this is something which we are happy to discuss in a procedure with all experts. If the Georgian government, when the Georgian government says, we would like to know, and please tell us what we should do. Um, other countries that were in a similar situation were very much forthcoming. We have with us here somebody who worked on Hungary and its succession at some point. And uh, Hungary back then was a very forthcoming country, was very interested in, uh, in, in doing absolutely everything that was necessary in order to uh, join the European Union. Um, we had other countries like Slovakia, which were much more difficult back then. Today, things are maybe the other way around, but that's not an, that's another discussion for another day. It is a question of the political will of the country and, of course, of the government to come to us and say, look, guys, we know we have a problem. Help us solve it. This is all we are there for. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, political will, you know, that's uh, the key issue here. Um, so I want to come back to, to you, um, Natalie, because Michael, you know, mentioned, you know, all the parties should sit together. Um, to find a way forward to work together. Um, but this seems to be really still very difficult um, in Georgia. It seems to me that you know, the ruling party um, and the opposition are, are more focused on destroying each other than actually showing the necessary solidarity um, to you know, working towards this, this amazing future um, for, for Georgia, quite honestly, something that the population wants. So do you, I mean, do you think there's a realistic chance that this is going to be overcome? I mean, in, in, in the near future, I mean, the opposition party still seems to be um, saying that it doesn't want to work with the government still because of, you know, the fraud, fraud what it says were fraudulent elections. Um, so how can this be changed? Uh, thank you, Amanda, for a million dollar question. Um, well, I think it can be changed. I don't know whether it can happen soon. Uh, and I think we have to look at what really is happening in Georgia and understand what is happening in Georgia. Polarization has always been part of the Georgian political life. We never had a kind of Swedish style civilized political debates, right? It has always been rather uh, edgy, let's put it this way. But what we see today is, um, qualitatively new phenomena, like what we see today is uh, the kind of polarization that destroys uh, the destroys space for democratic political contestation. When your uh, political opponent is no longer a simple political rival, but at an enemy that needs to be destroyed and wiped out of the earth, at that point, when you reach that kind of point, and, and Michael referred to discourse, when that is also reflected in the discourse, it is very difficult to talk about democracy, right? Because this is the kind of space where you simply can't. You need to have a little bit different space where different actors can come in. So that's one feature that is very typical and destroys democracy. And all parties there are 
uh, guilty of uh, of this, but obviously um, the ruling party has more uh, responsibility because they don't have to sit around and wait for the UNM to change its discourse. They can start. They are the ones in power, right? Um, the second point is that we are moving, and Hungary was mentioned quite interestingly, we are experiencing kind of urbanization of Georgian democracy. Georgia is consolidating as a hybrid, a liberal democracy, uh, competitive authoritarianism, whatever want you name you want to call it, they're different. But in essence, uh, you know, they're all the same. Basically, you have a democratic facade. And it's very important to have a democratic facade with its elections, with its institutions, and so on, uh, and so forth. But uh, the essence of democracy is eroded because uh, competition is so uneven and the, the, the um, playing field is so uneven that it's basically impossible to achieve results, right? So you have a consolidation of power in the hands of um, one political force. Uh, so this is the second feature. And now you have this kind of situation. And the question is whether Georgia will be able to fulfill all these points that actually, and in fact, they really aim at destroying this system that has been created. So we are asking those actors to destroy the system that they thrive on. And this kind of hybrid regimes actually thrive on polarized uh, competition. Uh, that's exactly what sustains them. This is Georgian Dream has been using it very well and the UNM has been obliging. So, I mean, the two sides there are engaged in this um, battle. Now you ask me what can be uh, changed and whether, I mean, I've described a very bleak situation where actually the, the way out, unless you change the system is hard to see. And I believe that unless we, tackle the systemic problem that has been established in Georgia, it will be hard to, um, to achieve results. The problem here is, and, and I think it's possible, there are different styles. For example, my solution, and I've been thinking about it, and now from the point of view of more of an academic, I think Georgia needs to move um, consciously towards consensus democracy. It's a model that exists, that has been tested in, uh, uh, in Netherlands, it exists in Belgium, it deals precisely, it is, has been invented precisely for countries that are extremely divided. Very often, it's, whether it's ethnic divisions, religious divisions, or political divisions, doesn't matter. But this is the kind of, it's not traditional Westminster model, but kind of more a uh, quota system model where you have guaranteed access for the opposition to some decision making. It's an imposed power sharing model. And in that case, once you have imposed power sharing where um, opposition feels responsible, it is part of the decision making, it will change the dynamics of behavior and the government or the ruling party also learns how to share the power and, and has a kind of a, a, a systemic breaks are put in place against usurping power. So we need to change and kind of lead the country in that direction. Um, to ask for depolarization, and you you answered, uh, you know, your question about benchmarks was also um, important because I think to put as a condition depolarization without really saying, you know, how it's going to be measured and what it really means in the case of Georgia. Um, it's not going to lead us very far. I think it needs to have a more kind of structured and clear breakdown of things, what it means beyond changing discourse. And we see that even changing discourse is difficult, but because we have the same actors and that's what they're used to doing, unless the system around them changes that imposes on them different mode of behavior as well as different discourse. Thank you, Natalie. I think you, what you suggested then, um, I mean, it would be an, an excellent um, solution um, to, to move forward, actually. But I mean, how possible it is to achieve that in, in Georgia, at least at the moment, seems to be, you know, rather questionable. But, you know, what one, one can hope. Um, but I want to come. I, well, first of all, I want to say to the audience, because I forgot to say this at the beginning. Um, if you have a question, please, can you 
flag it up. I mean, to the guys in the room, if you could sort of identify or make a sign to me that you have a question. Um, but to the people on the line, please, can you um, type in the in the Q and A box to my colleague here, um, Jana, and she will you, she will flag this up to me. Um, but I just want to come come back to you, um, Tiona, because in this process, um, the civil society is also you know flagged up as having to play a crucial role. And we know, for example, like in in the in the in the in the scenario in, in Ukraine, I mean, Ukrainian civil society was absolutely crucial in enforcing the government or pushing the government to actually do reforms. But I mean, I, I want to understand better now this, the the role of civil society in Georgia because we talk about polarization, um, but it seems to me that polarization in Georgia um, is also civil society is is also polarized. Um, and that seems to be like problematic uh, to me for obvious reasons. I mean, is that the case? Uh, and is there a way that civil, uh, civil society can actually change the way that they work to be able to operate as one as one group with the same goal rather than focusing on, the, the let's say, um, the policies of their own parties? That would be the first question. Um, and the second question to you is actually regarding um, Russia. Um, I mean, how does how do you think um, Russia will try to gain um, from the fact that Georgia hasn't received candidate country status and that it's still in the process of working towards it. And linked to that now would be the situation regarding disinformation um, and Russian narratives that are going around Georgia. I mean, to what extent is this being used now, perhaps more than ever, um, to undermine this process? Uh, thank you, Amanda. Um... I will indeed, uh, very interesting questions. I will answer, try to answer them. But before, also a few comments regarding the polarization, because I also think that we need to understand the context of the Georgian uh, polarization, because uh, in general, also in the academic literature, we know the polarization that is ideological polarization. And uh, well, But in the case of Georgia, then I would argue that this is not an ideological polarization, because if you look at the also um, uh, uh, polls and the, uh, in this regard, research uh, uh, outcomes, uh, then you would also see that uh, there is uh, a very little difference when it comes to the political parties' programs, especially on the economic uh, aspects. And then the citizens and the citizens and the electorates are they all of them are uh, united when it comes to their major concern that is uh, an economic uh, situation, unemployment, and that is also the uh, foreign policy di uh, dimension of Georgia that is uh, uh, becoming the member of the EU and, and NATO eventually. So, and therefore, I think we need to understand that it is a kind of, I would call it maybe pragmatic polarization that is really imposed by the political elites and which is not a mass polarization, that this is something that uh, or, uh, is, not, uh, is, I would say, uh, uh, in this regard, a rather top-down uh, uh, process. And why this is important? This is important because uh, I, I think that uh, in this respect, we need to really underline the uh, responsibility, first of all, of the political parties. But Amanda, you are right, not only political parties, but also the civil society actors, which definitely, in my in my uh, humble observations, are indeed uh, uh, a certain extent polarized. And I will give you an example. Uh, but uh, the political parties in this respect also need to uh, take the major responsibility and Natalie has mentioned, of course, power sharing, but in Georgia, I would say, yes, power sharing is in, uh, key, like in every democratic state. But then um, in Georgian reality, the problem is that political parties, they always want more. So when they have a shared power, no, but they don't want even more and more. And that's how, and that's why also this contestation and this, uh, let's say, battle for power emerges in Georgia. So... Um, uh, regarding the civil society, uh, yes, uh, uh, Ukraine was really a success story in this respect. Uh, I would say that Georgia needs more active and vibrant, vibrant civil society also in Brussels. And I really hope that uh, the time will come. And I think that with this new enlargement, uh, let's say that uh, this is back in the EU, uh, let's say, agenda, that uh, uh, Georgian civil society, together with also civil society of uh, 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 Moldova and Ukraine, in the format of the EU associated trio, uh, really Recently, I'm really, let's say, trying to advocate this idea to uh, build a common, let's say, civil expert uh, 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 group. We remember the example of BIPAC, which is in the case of the Western Balkans, when this Western Balkans six uh, expert group were very much also important, not only in advocating the Western Balkans integration process, but also producing the 
policy uh, 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 solutions and recommendations. In the case of Georgia and associated trade, we do not have this kind of uh, uh, outcome. And this is one thing. Uh, and regarding now, Russia, because I, I see that uh, I'm running out of the time. Um, yeah, no, one point about the civil society. We do, should not uh, forget about the existence of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society platform in Georgia. But there are also some questions regarding the level of their uh, engagement and activities, because uh, you know, at some point, uh, they were rather, as far as I was informed, uh, uh, because I had uh, uh, some consultations with Georgian civil society prior to this event, this uh, platform was not really active before this famous uh, 12 recommendations and uh, the uh, their engagement in the working groups. Now, of course, they are uh, rather pretty much engaged, but there are also some questions why uh, some other, let's say, key civil society organizations, such as, for instance, uh, 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 Young Lawyers Association in Georgia and other organizations, they do not really cooperate with the Eastern Partnership Civil Society platform in Georgia. So I think that this, this already signals to a certain extent existing division and this needs to be over, uh, overcome and uh, it needs to also take into account that we need to work together at the uh, domestic level but also trying to uh, uh, mobilize our efforts uh, uh, in Brussels and that it, not only Brussels because Mikhail has really had a great point when he mentioned that it's not commission but it's the member states we, so we need also the key member states where this uh, civil society needs to advocate for and convince them for uh, uh, for the uh, European future of these three countries so um yeah, Russia. Of course, Russia is is uh, and will uh, um, find all the necessary ways to exploit the weaknesses of the EU. And I think that here it comes uh, the uh, importance of the strategic communication to the Georgian society, because we know that uh, EU integration is a very long and very uh, arduous process. It's not tomorrow. It's not day after. It's not in five years. It's not in ten years that we will become the member of the EU. And this will be very much exploited by the uh, far right groups, also by Russia. And therefore, strategic communication, explaining also how the EU works in practice and what are the processes that leads us to this uh, uh, outcome needs to be uh, very much uh, uh, communicated. And I think that finally, we also need to understand not only, uh, I, I believe also, first of all, political parts, but also the civil society and other actors. This is my view that uh, George, Georgia's EU integration and EU membership, EU membership should not be, let's say, the uh, goal uh, per se of uh, or the aim of the state. It's a means to reforms. It's a means that we advance on our democratic agenda. It's a means and a tool to uh, to uh, build the consensus-based and more, uh, let's say, a democratic and uh, resilient country uh, as such. So, uh, well, I think we need in this. Uh, uh, regard, a, uh, let's say, a uh, long-term uh, vision. Thank you. Thank you, um, Siona. Yes, a long-term vision is a good idea, right? Um, so I want to take these questions um, that we have here, because I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to put, put them. Um, we have two online. The first one is from um, Klaus um, Klipp, um, who's basically asking, um, with polarization now a criteria, um, is this not an invitation um, to the Russians to stir up, you know, the maximum amount of unrest possible? Um, that would be the first one. Um, the second one is from an anonymous um, attendee. So that's very um, mysterious. Um, would you agree that the EU decision not to grant the candidate country status was perceived in Georgia as a cold shower? Is there still enough enthusiasm um, not just from the public officials, but also from civil society um, to continue um, along the EU path. And maybe I could add there, you know, is there still enthusiasm from the general population? I mean, I think there is, but I mean, maybe that's been reduced slightly because we didn't talk about how this decision was um, received by the general population in Georgia. Um, and last but not least, um, you had a comment or a question, I think, yeah. sir. So I'll let you put it and then we'll... Sure. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Georgi Vashadze, Member of Parliament of Georgia, Chairman of Strategy Builder. So I was the part of all the negotiations which we're discussing here. And by the way, our party was one of the deal makers in uh, for the last year, 19 of April. And I remember we were sitting in the President Palace of Georgia together with President Jean Michel, together with the Speaker of the Parliament who were representing Georgian Dream. And my question to them was, Instead of the fact that UNM has not signed this agreement, 
deal is done or not? And the answer was yes. And when we're speaking and when we're somehow bringing on the same level, uh, this uh, problem of opposition and ruling party, I a little bit disagree with that because deal was done. And that was the pass and way to the polar depolarization in Georgia. And unfortunately, that deal has failed only because Georgian dream, because they withdrew from that agreement. And they said that we don't care about this, such a big effort that were taken by European Union and the United States and personally by Charles Michel, who was participating twice, twice in our, let's say, um, in our dialogue between opposition and the ruling party. But main question I think here is, and I, I think that will be my question to the panelists as well. First of all, thank you very much for, in, uh, for, for this uh, kind of discussions about Georgia. That means that Georgia matters. That means that Georgia still has a chance to get candidacy. But question number one is, could Georgia get the candidate status in June? My answer to that is yes. So what happened and why we have not got this candidate status? That's a, that's a main question here. And the reason is not only April 19 agreement. Reason is the sequence of facts that was happening in Georgia before the final decision. And what was the sequence? Anti-Ukrainian rhetorics from the Georgian government, anti-Western rhetorics, blaming EU and United States that they want to open the second front, arresting just on the day when Prime Minister of Georgia has started his final visit to Brussels. Yeah, I, I understand just because I do think that there is lack of information maybe, I don't know, because lack of information and misinterpretation of some facts and that's why I wanted to bring this sequence. Then arrest of Nika Guaramia, owner of the main opposition channel and the director, just on the day of the last visit of Prime Minister of Georgia to Brussels. Yes. And the uh, adoption of the law on the wire taping, ambassador of EU were begging Georgian government not to do that before the decision. And I think these 12 points is almost the same, 70%, 80%, what was written in 19 April agreement. And my last point here, what is happening right now? You mentioned the working groups that opposition is not participating, but you don't know, maybe, that we initiated parliament extraordinary session in June, which were boycotted by the ruling party. And they offered us these informal meetings without rules and procedures, which is called working groups. And they offered us to go there and to work. What is the end result of that working groups? All the major civil society institutions are kicked out publicly by Georgian Dream. And we, together with civil, register, civil society, we published our version of the 12 points. We shared this with European Commission as well. And we showed that we're ready for the compromise. Opposition has showed that. And just my last point, to bring on the same level the ruling party and opposition, I think that's not fair, at least. That's not fair, if not more. and. We should understand, and my question to panelists as well, is there a chance to think that Georgia will get the candidate status if we deliver these 12 points in one year? And there is bigger chance or lower chance than it was in June or not? That's also my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The valuable, very valuable point and input. But I think, you know, your presentation by itself, you know, um, again, underlined, I mean, the huge challenge that Georgia is actually facing, uh, um, quite honestly. Um, but yeah, of I course, just listed all your, down the facts. Yeah, all your, yeah but I'm not, it's not a criticism, okay? Yeah. I'm just saying that it's, it, it, I see this very confrontational um, approach, if I can just put it that way. Um, but I will let the panelists respond maybe to the last point that you had. But I want to give the floor now because we had one other question um, to Bidzina. He's online. Bidzina, are you there? Not even. Are you with us? Not even really. <laughs> no, no, well, no, not that Bidzina. <laughs> but he's welcome if he has one. Yes. Okay, Bidzina. Dakavishvili, are you there? 
Or not. Okay. Well, while we're trying to figure him out, I, I'm going to put back, come back to the to the panelists. To perhaps, I mean, if you want to respond to anything that uh, Gorgi said, but also on the other two questions that were put by the the, um, the virtual guests. I can uh, I can take uh, some of these uh, aspects if if I may. Um, first of all, the question whether. If Georgia delivers on all the 12 points uh, in next year, it will get candidate status. I believe yes. I mean, this is this is our procedure. We are the commission. Of course, the decision is taken by the member states, by the European Council. We cannot um, we cannot forecast what the member states will discuss in December uh, 2023, uh, when they will gather on the basis of the whole enlargement package, on the basis of our analysis on the basis of our recommendations. But there is no, no foreseeable um, reason why, if Georgia has fulfilled all the issues, is uh, in perfect shape in, uh, in our view, the member states would, uh, would then not grant candidate status. I think this is, this is very straightforward. And this is also what I keep telling to those who want to listen, and I think what we keep telling at all levels, it is in Georgia. The ball is in Georgia's court. To come back to uh, to to uh, to the football analogy, it's up to Georgia to do the right things now. And we believe we can help. We can we can do this. And um, this answers to to a certain extent the the other question about the cold shower. Civil society in Georgia is adamant. They want European Union membership. This is. All opinion polls uh, have that uh, um, at, at a, at a clear, as a clear result. The um, the uh, parts of society of, of those, those uh, respondents, respondents say eighty five percent, seventy five percent, a huge majority clearly want European Union membership, and that's also why we are relatively confident that in the medium term things will move in the right direction. This is not fifty two percent. This is not 55%. It's a clear majority, and the clear and and this clear majority also came out at one of the biggest demonstrations, pro-European demonstration that I've ever heard of, let alone seen. The uh, um, roughly 160,000 people who came out onto the streets in Tbilisi in this uh, in this summer to advocate for the government to do anything necessary to move things forward and to become a candidate. Uh, to get the candidate status. And, and this is something where we believe we are fully in line with the large majority of the Georgian population. I have no doubt about this. And, and the details that we've listed, listed will make Georgia a better country. And that's the whole idea. We're there to make the world a better place, to say, to say it a bit philosophically. We're trying to improve countries. We're trying to make the processes there better for the benefit of the people. This is all we do for better democracy, for better politics, for more inclusive politics for everybody, which will filter down to better economies, better better legal application, uh, a better application of the rule of law. And this is all we are there for in the commission. And we believe that this is where Georgia can go. And the faster it gets there, the better for the country and the better for the question of becoming a candidate. Thank you. The first question is, who's Georgia? I think I said yes. yes. You're in helping, June. helping. In June. Yeah. And if they will deliver the reforms. Well, okay, yeah. if they had delivered the reforms, yeah. but this is conditional too, we very rarely use that in politics. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but, um, back to you, um, Natalie, if you would like to comment on those questions that were yeah. put. Uh, yes, I will uh, start by the question on uh, depolarization. Um, I don't know whether that's a recipe for uh, Russia to keep the instability going and so on, but I sort of um, agree with the spirit of the question. I think depolarization as a condition is, is a very abstract one and it needs to be defined more clearly. Now, when I was talking about power sharing, and here I want to also kind of respond to Teona's point, Georgia never had power sharing. We don't know what it is. It's not like the parties wanting more. We always had a winner-takes-it-all system. 
This is what needs to be changed, where you have the kind of power sharing I'm talking about is a guaranteed representation of opposition in the governance structures. And that will give them stake and greater responsibility to be less destructive, perhaps as well. Um, and it is an entirely different uh, ball game. And I think if we have instead of deep, and this of course leads to depolarization. And if we have, that's the whole idea, right? Is to keep of of this model is to keep the states together, basically, and, and and teach how to build consensus. So if we have conditionality which is more geared to concrete steps, for example, power sharing and how to do it, I think would be more uh, useful for making uh, uh, Georgia a better place to uh, echo what Michael was saying. Uh, in terms of enthusiasm, I think there is clearly enthusiasm in Georgia. I mean, we are probably the most Euro enthusiastic country. It is true. Uh, although there was a degree of disappointment. And I have to say the disappointment was also fed very cleverly and clearly by the ruling party. Uh, and here I agree with Mr. Vashete. I mean, the, the ruling party has sort of uh, engaged in Eurosceptic narrative and saying that, well, we didn't receive it because we didn't support the war, because we didn't uh, get engaged in war. I mean, this whole, you know, parallels with the, uh, you, either you have a European future or you need to fight, which is absolutely, um, untrue. Um, this this uh, propagation of the idea that this was unfair and so on and so forth. So there was a deliberate also campaign uh, which uh, had its own domestic political purposes. And this is not helping the Euro enthusiasm in uh, the country, although it, it remains very, very high. And this is the, uh, the choice of the Georgian public. And furthermore, I mean, it is a constitutional responsibility. Um, whether there is a chance for us to uh, catch up, so to say, I think, of course, there is a chance. That's why we have a plan. Um, and But what is most important for the decision, and now I'm answering Mr. Vashad's question, is precisely what Michael was saying, and that is convincing skeptics. And how do we convince skeptics is by, well, first of all, delivering without question marks. I think that would help. And secondly, you know, by delivering, sort of making a moral case that Georgia deserves it, there cannot be any question about, you know, the criteria based deserving. And uh, when I say moral case, I also mean like, you know, the, the skeptics should feel sort of moral discomfort by denying Georgia European future. But in order to do this, we should perform not just well, but even better than what is expected from us. And it's possible. It's a matter of the will and, and decision and all uh, uh, players uh, engaging. Thank you. Yeah, I think that Georgia will have to perform better than it's being um, asked to do because I do think that as time goes by, I mean, I would hope that Georgia could actually get it in, get it in June. But I mean, as time goes by, I mean, the sort of enthusiasm, if I can put it that way, among EU member states um, for the candidate country that existed um, back in the summer um, is probably going to um, ebb away because even back then there were some member states that weren't really on board and they had to be convinced and the geopolitical situation pushed them to make that decision. Um, so, um, Tiona, I'll, I will give you the floor also to have a chance to respond um, to anything, but I mean, also maybe to this to this issue. I mean, are, are you concerned that, I mean, let's say one year down the road, it would be it would be much more difficult um, to actually get the green light for candidate country status than what it was, um, you know, earlier, earlier this year? I mean, also, we would have gone through a really difficult winter. Um, we don't know what the state of the economy, energy situation is going to be, and all these things are going to are going to are going to um, going to to matter. Indeed, dear Amanda, and uh, I think that here also um, we should, um, and uh, it was also mentioned that uh, in um, October 2023, then uh, Georgia will be part of the enlargement package. So with, and it will be 10 countries. So it will be new reporting system. We are part of the package. And then I think that much will depend really uh, uh, in this uh, period, so upcoming one year, uh, the assessment process by the European Commission and what we will be seeing in this uh, uh, report uh, produced by the European uh, Commission. 
situation. So, um, well, of course, I, I, I hope that uh, we will uh, and we will have some positive uh, uh, assessment uh, to get the candidate status. But again, I agree, and this is not nothing. It's no secret that uh, everything depends on, on, on the political will. Uh, and uh, yes, Mr. Rashad mentioned that uh, opposition has started uh, another parallel process of uh, uh, the working group. Uh, but I think we have never seen also the uh, action plan, uh, at least uh, you know, from the opposition parties about the. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, but, well. It, Okay, but I think that's, uh, I think, well, this is my uh, position that, well, yeah, that uh, in order to have this, uh, uh, let's say, more um, unanimous, let's say, uh, march towards the, uh, uh, towards this process, I think that uh, we need to avoid parallel processes. So I think it's better to, to work really together with the, uh, uh, with the, with the actors that are part of the yeah. So, um, and then I think in this respect, again, the major emphasis will be put on the uh, depolarizing situation. And I, I have one point in this respect uh, uh, because we remember also the Jean Monnet dialogue, which was uh, which was uh, failed. And I remember Viola uh, von Kramen has corrected me in Prague that ah no 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 it's not really failed because we never started. We never started because uh, there was never never uh, uh, this uh, yeah readiness uh, from uh, from either side. And I think this is, uh, with all due respect to the members of the parliament who are involved uh, in a political dialogue, but also in communication with Georgia, I think that we need uh, to kind of relaunch also the communication and engagement with the Georgian uh, politicians, because we have also seen rather uh, difficult uh, situations, right? And I'm wondering, dear uh, Mika, if uh, to what extent uh, uh, it is possible that the commission also, uh, uh, from its uh, neutral position from its position of a guardian of the treaties, you know, gets involved also in structured uh, uh, dialogue to be a facilitator of the process, because that was in my initial point. Of course, we have a political engagement, we, we had a political engagement of Charles Michel, but maybe this was, you know, too high level, this was too, again, uh, uh, oriented uh, uh, on the um, uh, uh, immediate goals. And I think that uh, maybe if the commission could also uh, get involved in, uh, uh, in this uh, facilitation a process, perhaps also by partnering with some democracy um, support organizations to have a more systematic approach, uh, maybe this also needs a ref uh, reflection. And another point, dear Amanda, because it also re uh, concerning the candidate status, yes, this is uh, the goal, but also on the other hand, I think that we need also a debate regarding uh, the applicability of this uh, staged accession, or of, of these new ideas of the staged accessions, which is now being uh, debated in the case of the Western Balkans. To what extent associated Three countries can also be part of this uh, staged accession process. For instance, if we can have an access to the single market, if, for instance, we can have some um, uh, some um, uh, uh, powers, in, I mean, observer, let's say, being observer participants in some of the high-level meetings, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so to get more institutional understanding of, of of the functioning of the European Union, because this is socialization. And um, last point about the socialization effect is the European political community, which I think. It's also merits to be mentioned that Georgia was part of the and is part of the European political community. It's a pity that next summit, summit will take place in Moldova, not in Georgia. I think there was a possibility of this uh, hosting this uh, next summit in uh, in uh, Georgia. But my point is that indeed this type of uh, I know uh, informal uh, setting uh, uh, is also important to uh, uh, have rapprochement uh, with the EU in terms of the uh, uh, debates, but in terms of those institutionalization and socialization. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Tiona. Um, I need to close this event now, and um, I apologize because I just noticed we just ran 15 minutes um, over time, but I think that's an attestation to, you know, how interesting and important uh, this topic um, actually is. I mean, it really draws you in, um, just like the country itself actually draws you in, not just because of the wine and the excellent food. Huh? Um, so I really want to thank um, our speakers from coming um, and, sh and sharing, you know, their perspectives on what's happening in Georgia in terms of meeting the criteria, what the problems are, you know, the challenges and what we can expect and what's this all about. Because at the end of the day, I think, all Georgians, you know, share the same vision, or most Georgians, including all of the, you know, the political, political elites. I mean, they want to see their country in the EU. First and foremost, these reforms, of course, you know, as we always say, 
or for Georgia itself. This is the first part. But I mean, everybody has a common vision um, for the future. So I think these these you know obstacles and these differences between the parties really need to be you know overcome. It's in the benefit of everybody. So maybe some heads uh, need to be cracked. Um, so Georgia will be. Um, I mean, Georgia's future, I think, should and will be part of the EU. I think it will be positive. Um, and I also think the EU itself will be a better place um, with Georgia in it, because, you know, diversity bu builds strength. And I think Georgia would be, you know, a, a crucial and valuable partner in the union. So um, good luck with the process. I mean, EPC will be following um, this um, road very carefully. We're planning many more um, events and analysis together, me together with my colleague um, Jana. It's nice to have Georgian colleagues here as well. Um, so I look forward to seeing you at our different events and other activities in the future. And thanks to everybody for joining us today and have a good uh, evening and rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda.